Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Hope, and thank you to the IFOPA for having me. I must say that I am no expert at clinical trials, but in my work as a genetic counsellor, I speak with a lot of patients about clinical trials. We get a lot of questions, so we do a lot of research in terms of what's available and um, sort of translate the science behind clinical trials and the process into sort of a, maybe a more um, user-friendly um, information. So hopefully I can share some of those tips um, with you today. So I'm gonna be speaking about what a clinical trial is and the aspects of that, but I just wanted to say, give you a little bit of introduction as to where I'm from. So I'm from South Africa. For those of you who don't know, it's right at the bottom of Africa. Um, and we are quite a, a large country. We have about 58 million people. Um, but we are quite new to the FOP organization, so it's, it's really such a, a pleasure to be here. And I'm sure some of you have seen the Tin Soldiers Project, and we're working on that to try and identify our um, missing FOP patients. Um, so specifically, I live in the city of Cape Town, which I hope you will agree with me is a very beautiful city. Um, and please come and visit. We welcome visitors, and you're more than welcome to contact me if you need a, a tour guide. Um, so our offices and the hospitals we work are just below the mountains, so um, there's a lot going on and a lot to do, but luckily every day when I walk into the office, I get to see such a beautiful view. Okay, so what am I gonna cover today? Um, firstly, the thinking behind clinical trials um, and why are they done the way that they're done? Because I know sometimes it can be frustrating to understand that, that long process. Then specifically, what is a randomized um, double blind trial? What does a real clinical trial look like? And what does a bad, bad clinical trial look like? And how can you protect yourself um, and your, your, your children or your families? So I'm starting with a little dialogue, uh, just to keep you entertained. So we have a doctor and he says, do you suffer from painful lumps in your back? I have just the thing. It works for everything from heartbreak to psoriasis. It will certainly work for your pain painful lumps. And you might ask, how do you know? And he says, I've been prescribing it for years. I promise it works here, ask this guy. And this um, young man says, oh yes, it, it works wonderfully, I've never been better. And you ask, what is the catch? And the doctor replies, that's the best thing, there are no side effects, but first, let's talk about how much you need to pay. So the amazing thing is that even though this doctor's treatment might just be sugar water and a fancy bottle, some people really felt better taking it, and maybe this young man was one of them, but why? So we've, we've heard a lot in, in the talks about the placebo group, and so I'm gonna just explain a little bit about what that is. So placebo is a fake medication, essentially, and it is designed to look exactly like the real medication, but has no active medication in it. And people get better on this, on this placebo, even though they think they are being given the real medication when in fact it is just sugar or water. And the placebo effect is when is something that's that's been studied for many years and, and people say that belief is the oldest form of medication. So there's a quote here by Thomas Jefferson which says, one of the most successful physicians I've ever known has assured me that he used more bread pills, drops of colored water, powders of hickory ash than all other medicines put together. And, and I think doctors um, have, have maybe in the past used sort of sham, sham treatments because that makes for a happier patient. But the interesting thing is that the definition of placebo is I shall please. And the placebo response has many different overlapping uh, psychological underlying phenomena um, um, about it. So I'll speak to each of those. So 
they, they speak about regression to the mean, and, and I'm sure you can all agree with me that the natural course of, of any disease, specifically FOP, has its up and downs. And this is when an average person was going to get better. They, they may have presented to a doctor at a time when they weren't doing so well, and then they, they got better, but that was gonna happen regardless of what medication they were taking. Then you have confirmation bias, and that's when people start thinking and looking for signs that they are getting better, and therefore they start finding those signs. And, and I'm sure we all know that when we're being watched, our behavior changes, and I think that is sort of the underlying um, reason for that. Then we also have an expectation to get better, and it's something that we learn, which is sort of cause and effect. When we take an active drug, we, we take a, a pain medication, we often feel better, and so we associate that um, with getting better. So we revisit that memory. Then we have social learning, and, and we might view other people on the medication that are getting better, and therefore we, we start to feel better. And we get cues on how we should respond to certain medications based on the environment around us. Then um, sort of a more complicated um, phenomenon is, is that our brains learn to associate taking a pill with relief. And we start to produce chemicals in our brain which um, kicks in that relief. And, that's a complicated mechanism on how our brain sort of learns how to respond. And then finally, the least understood um, is, is about the environment in which we take the medication in. And studies have shown that um, the, how we get better is, is associated with where the environment we're giving the medication and the encounters with the people giving us that medication. So, how do we make sure that medication actually works? And, and we have clinical trials, and we've spoken about the clinical trials um, at this gathering specifically for um, treatments or ways to, to reduce um, ossification. But not all clinical trials study treatments. They also study ways to detect, ways to diagnose, and ways to learn about the disease, like through the, the natural um, uh, history study. And Ultimately, whatever we're looking at, we need to find a way to measure it. So we have two groups of people. One is getting the placebo, one is getting the medication, and we have certain endpoints or measurements that we need to take to ultimately gather data and get an answer about either the medication or about the disease. But the main thing with, with any clinical trial is about keeping the patient safe. And that's why we follow quite a, a lengthy process. So they start off by testing um, animals. And we heard a lot about mouse models and, and the work was that, that is done on those. And then they start to test healthy humans. They then test a small number of patients with the illness. And obviously that number varies depending on what type of illness it is. It's slightly different in a, in a rare uh, disease. Then they need to uh, confirm those findings in a bigger group of, of individuals. And then finally, they, they can then move on to test children. So that's a simpler, simpler version of this, which is sort of the, the step process of, of a clinical trial and can be find, found on um, clinicaltrials.gov. And it speaks as to the different phases, which is terminology that I think you should make yourselves familiar with because it's terminology that's used a lot by um, the pharmaceutical companies. So we have phase one, which is uh, to check for safety. That's usually in healthy volunteers and, and, and usually a large amount of people. They then just test for efficacy, which is, is done in, in patients. They then need to confirm those findings in a larger patient um, population, and again, those numbers vary depending on how large that population of patients actually is. And then finally, in phase four, they can test the long-term safety of, of the drug and look at what levels um, of the drug the patients need to receive. So with clinical trials, the gold standard is what we call randomized placebo-controlled trials. and, and you, what happens is we have a study population or a, a group of patients with, with the disease, and then it's sort of a toss of a dice. 
one group gets assigned the, the new treatment or a new drug, and the other gets given the placebo. In some cases, when there is already current treatment available, we're not gonna take patients off that treatment, so they will remain on that current treatment. Then that, that is assigned randomly, and we can have two types of, of this placebo-controlled trial. So we have either single blind or double blind. So single blind is when the patient doesn't know that they are receiving, it, what they're receiving. Are they receiving the medication or are they receiving the placebo? But then you can also have a double blind where the patient and the doctor that is operating the clinical trial don't know what the patient is receiving as well. And both of those groups are then um, studied and we, we look at clinical outcomes, we look at biomarkers, and we obviously look at adverse effects. And there's a slightly different um, design which has been used more recently, and I think especially in, in rare um, diseases, um, because obviously, and I'm sure many of you are parents or patients, and, and it's frustrating to get to a clinical trial and, and be given a placebo. So some trials are designed in that you will, everyone will receive the treatment, but at different points um, in the trial. So it's, it's a blind start. You don't know when you are switched from the placebo to the medication. And it can be helpful in rare diseases because it allows an inpatient comparison. And we spoke a lot about the heterogeneity of, of FOP and how variable it is among patients. So it allows um, the researchers to compare a placebo and the drug within the same patient. So just a little bit as to the words used in, in clinical trials. So enroll would be being put in that trial. We have investigator, which is the doctor that is doing the trial. We have the sponsor, which is the company that makes the drug. Consent, which involves signing to be um, a part of the trial and understanding all of that that goes with um, giving informed consent. Then um, the participant is usually the, the patient that's taking place. And then we have the IRB, which is the Institutional Review, Review Board or Ethics Committee. And that makes sure that trials are conducted um, ethically. So speaking to that, we have what we call good clinical practice guidelines. And these are a set of rules that every single person who conducts a clinical trial must follow. And this ensures that doctors and nurses and whoever is doing the study never forget the right way to do the study. So these are ethical and scientific guidelines which are put in place to ensure that. And the main reason is obviously to protect the rights, the safety and the well-being of, of patients. And this, um, all uh, people that are involved in a clinical trial are required to write an exam to make sure that they have met these good clinical practice guidelines and are aware of them, which is important. So why do we have um, good clinical practice guidelines? Unfortunately, many years ago, some doctors did not study, um, did not perform studies in the correct way, and that meant that patients were treated um, incorrectly and unfairly. And unfortunately, this still happens today, and if a study is not done the right way, we need to change that. So I think the main thing and something that's important to remember is that you are number one and and you need to be active ensuring that you are number one and, and there's a lot of um, a lot of resources out there to, to get information about clinical trials and, and the drug companies will usually have that on their web websites, they'll explain the whole process and so it's important that you remember that you are number one. So how to spot a safe trial? So it's important that the trial is open, okay? Um, there needs to be lots of information about the trial, and there needs to be transparency, and I think that's something that I found in, uh, very unusual in a good way um, about this, this meeting, is that the pharmaceutical companies are here, and they're involved, and, and that is a good sign of transparency. So you need to know before entering a clinical trial as much information as, as, as you need to make um, the best decisions. 
Also, consent is important, and this consent needs to be informed, and that's why that information is so important. And it's important for you to remember that you can withdraw consent at any time in a clinical trial. Um, but especially when we're dealing with children, that consent is, is slightly different, but even more important. Then something that, that I think is, is, is interesting is that in a, in a safe trial, it should seem complicated, okay? And the reason I say that is because if you read any scientific paper about the science behind somebody who has conducted a clinical trial, it, it, it's complicated, it might not make sense to you, but that's a good sign because the, the, the science behind these drugs, behind FOP, is complicated. So if a trial seems too simple, then maybe you need to question that, okay? All trials should be registered on um, clinicaltrials.gov, and you can find those trials and find more information about them. You must ensure that there are no promises, okay, and no guarantees, no incentives, and no cost, no threats, because all of those are sort of like red flags when, when thinking about a clinical trial, okay? And when, when as, as patients and as parents, we, we are a vulnerable group, okay, and people unfortunately take advantage of that. So as much as it's nice to be promised things and it's nice to be incentivized, we need to make sure that that's, that's not influencing your decision to do a clinical trial. So some questions that you, that you should ask before entering a clinical trial. Why do the doctors think this treatment works? Um, what, what is the science behind it? And your, your physician should be well informed about clinical trials and they're good people to, to turn to for that information. Are there other options? And when it comes to, to FOP, there are other options and it's important that you look at all those other options, not only with, with clinical trials, but other medication as well, okay? Um, is there a placebo? And I know that's, that's a concern for, for many of you. And I hope I've shown that placebo is important, okay, in, in conducting a trial, and unfortunately that's reality. But sometimes there are ways around that. Um, but it's important you have that information. Will there be blood taken and stored? Or are there any other procedures that, that are, are required to, to get that information or to get those endpoints? How often, how much? Um, and what is that going to require from you as, as a patient or your child? Will you be taking and storing my genetic information? I think that's a very important question to ask, and I, I feel quite strongly about that as a genetic counsellor. And with, with testing um, becoming more accessible and easy, we need to be conscious what we're signing away. Kind of like when we... we into a website and it tells us to read the T's and C's, we don't. But when it comes to your genetic information, I think that you need to read those T's and C's. What are they gonna do with my genetic information? And what am I willing to sign away in terms of future research, things like that? Um, what will you check on the blood tests? There might be tests that, that could find other things and you need to be aware of that. How long um, is the study? Um, that's important for you in terms of finances, in terms of resources and what commitment you're making. And can you take other medication during the trial? And that is important to discuss with the doctor and obviously the, the people running the trial and is important maybe certainly in the future when there are medications approved and available for FOP and you still want to participate in, trial, in a trial, is that possible? Is it possible to continue that medication? Can I stop any time? And that goes back to that idea of, of informed consent. You need to know what your obligations are in terms of the trial. Um, you need to know when and if you can leave should you, should you wish to. And then will I get medicine after the study is over? So that is 
is probably uh, the one of the most important questions, and it differs between companies, it differs in countries, but it's a very important question to ask before entering the trial. You don't want to make an assumption, and then once you're in the trial, be disappointed at, th at the answer to that question. And that is all for me.